Saturday, an ABC special, an island paradise became a nuclear graveyard. Now the natives are returning, but what they find there could kill them. Their dangerous journey begins. Bikini Island, forbidden paradise. David Koresh died in an unholy firestorm. More than 60 adult members of his cult died with him. 24 children perished. A horrible, stark, ghastly tragedy has happened. Tonight, we will see more closely than we have seen before what life was like inside the Branch Davidian compound months before the apocalypse. President Clinton said today that the government was dealing with a madman. David Koresh was dangerous, irrational, and probably insane. But were they his prisoners, or had Koresh convinced them they would die fighting the forces of evil? They think I'm the son of God. Is he the son of God? I hope he is. David Koresh toyed with the government until the very end. There's a madman living in Waco. After such a tragic ending to a 51-day siege, there is still so much mystery. We've been trying for two and a half years to get the authorities to do something about this. How closely did the government listen? Did the government's experts really know what David Koresh was all about? Yeah, we got, we got a gun here, got a gun there. Fire, shoot to kill was the word, shoot to kill. Certainly the FBI was aware that there might be shooting. And when the government began to bring down the walls at Ranch Apocalypse, what did they think inside? They come in here with a gun and they start shooting at us, what would you do? This is an ABC News special. Waco, the decision to die. Now reporting from ABC World News headquarters, Peter Jennings. Good evening. We're here for the next hour because in the wake of the tragedy, there's clearly a very strong interest in the country to know more about the events in Waco yesterday, what they mean right now, and what they mean for the future. And there appears to be a profound desire in some quarters to understand this man, David Koresh, and his power over those who died with him. Why did they make this decision to die? It is widely believed the adults at least had a choice. Koresh had a choice. In case you didn't see it on the evening news, this is what the compound looks like now, completely leveled by the flames. Tonight, the Texas Rangers and the FBI are picking through the ashes in search of bodies and what clues, if any, there are to this cult's behavior in the final days and hours. We're going to try again, partly using video of the cult not seen in this country before to get inside David Koresh's head. We'll be back with that in just a moment. Tonight's ABC News special, brought to you by Sprint. For the perfect 800 service, follow Sprint. In many parts of America tonight, as best we can tell, there's still a real hunger to understand all that Waco came to represent, about the way that law enforcement officials make decisions, what they learn from their advisors, and certainly there is a determination in many quarters to know more about cults and the power which cult leaders exercise on the vulnerable. Last year, an Australian documentary film crew spent an extensive period of time inside the Waco compound with Koresh and his followers. Much of their film has not been seen in this country before. Tonight, Tom Jarrell leads us through it. It is a clue we think you'll find to the future as well as the past. Dr. Thiemann, we've obtained some of the most unusual, seldom seen, and complete preachings of David Koresh to his followers. The army's come, run on white horses, fear the night. We'd like you, as an educator and a theologian, to take a look at it and tell us what you think. Dr. Ronald Thiemann is dean of the Harvard Divinity School. Clearly he is using images from the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse of John in the lyrics of this song, and I take it that that's an extension of much of the way in which the community lived its life. His tongue is the pit of a... So how's God going to talk to me in the latter days? And who's going to bring that book? So there'll be no excuses! So it's a very strongly apocalyptic notion of a community under siege, a community of light surrounded by the forces of darkness.
The window to the world of David Koresh was based on the book of Revelations. Every living soul that accepts Christianity, I challenge them to show me the seven seals of Revelation 4 and 5. And if they can't do it, then I show them. And if they're honest, they'll see it. And that means I'm the Son of God. That's a particularly chilling passage because the fourth and fifth seals, the fourth seal of the book of Revelation, unleashes the pale rider, the rider of death, who brings disease, pestilence, war, and destruction. The fifth seal prepares the elect for their death. And there is a prediction that a certain number must die before the end comes. Did the FBI really understand the depth of his apocalyptic views? Bloodshed, inquisition, death, murder, killing. When the FBI was quoted as saying that had they known that he might commit an act of suicide, that they would not have taken the action that they did, it is an indication that they failed to understand the mindset altogether of someone whose world is being determined by this kind of apocalyptic worldview. This time, when Christ reveals himself, it's going to be according to the book. Because there's some statements in there that might make you a little bit happy. And the good news, okay. according to Koresh, was the most surprising of all. What about these people here? What well, are those what, people what here are people? Well, you know what they think of me? They think I'm the son of God. Do they? Yeah. I think he's great. <laughs> and how old are you? I'm 16. What would I do for him? I love him as a brother. Is he the son of God? I hope he is. But it's that faith that caused the deaths of at least 86 people. During the lengthy talks over the telephone with the FBI, was this, in effect, a dialogue of the deaf? When they asked him whether or not he would engage in an act of suicide, it was clear that the, answer he, the only answer he could give was no, because an act of suicide would have been an act of despair. From his point of view, the act of self-destruction was undoubtedly an act of faith. John was privileged on the Lord's Day, the Sabbath day, to be taken by the hand of providence and the hand of power to heaven to be shown an event which must be hereafter. It's prophecy. Why did the Jews nail Christ to the cross? They didn't know the prophecy. Was David Koresh as a religious man off the wall? It appears that he thought of himself as the Lamb, who is the figure or the symbol for Christ in the book of Revelation. If you read the book of Revelation, at no point is the community of the faithful ever to engage in acts of warfare or violence. When he saw no alternative to the final conflict between the FBI and his own community, when he saw that there was no other way out, the only form of interpretation he had available was to see this as some final battle some final confrontation between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Run away horses, the night. He had little choice, given the, the demonic world in which he lived, but to see this as a final confrontation. So I think if there had been a better understanding of the worldview out of which he was operating, there would have been an opportunity to give him some alternative, some other way out, because the final confrontation was, in some sense, what he had prepared his community for all of his life. Fire, shoot to kill was the word. Shoot to kill. And I do see him as eventually becoming very violent if he's pushed in a corner. I believe that they will kill for Vernon, and that is what he is. There's a madman living in Waco. The power of this madman, as told by three who broke away from the cult, were his skills at manipulation and mind control. Powerful skills, frightening skills. Fierce indignation. Melbourne musician James Tom recalled his first encounter with Koresh. When I first saw him, I thought, this guy is a splitting image of Charles Manson. This guy manipulates minds the same way that Charles Manson did. And he would ask me, like, you know, how far are you prepared to go? For him or for, for God, because, you know, he'd assume he was God. And I just ask him, well, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And he says, well, which one of your two children are you going to sacrifice? Meaning? Literally killing him. 
giving him to him for him to sacrifice or for myself to sacrifice. He had the means to do it, an obsession with all kinds of guns. 22s, 23s, I think. Anyhow, it's a fairly heavy caliber gun. There was quite a few of those. Handguns, um, police, um, riot shotguns. Um, probably about 20, 30 guns in all. The guns, of course, drew the federal lawman to the compound. He may have high-powered explosives and perhaps other, other armaments such as rockets. Do you have guns? Yeah, we have some. Can you show me? Uh, in some of the houses, you know. Well, can we see that? Is that okay? Well, I guess if you want. <laughs> However, when pressed, Koresh refused to show his arsenal. Yeah. This right here is what I told you in the beginning. You know what the public thinks about guns. You know in this country right now, legislation is to ban all guns, right? And it makes nobody's business whether we have a gun or not at this place. Guns are the right of Americans to have. You know, it's bringing up guns in, in, in a situation like this is something that can be, you know how people think. You know, it's just it's just not the issue we're dealing with right now, dealing with religion. A lot of people say, he's got guns, that makes him bad, that makes him a cult. They come in here with a gun, and they start shooting at us, what would you do? He not only kept control with guns, but with sex. He had multiple wives. This was one who was able to escape. I was one of his wives, I was just a single girl, and um, we were having babies for God. This California house, at one stage, was where 25 female cult members lived with David Koresh. They all were his wives. Vernon had his own room there, at the end of the hall. <laughs> it was his harem house. <laughs> and sometimes he'd say, I want to talk to you later. That was his way of saying, you know, come up and see me. <laughs> with his extended family, he followed another disturbing practice. He believed, according to his ex-wife, in severe spankings. John didn't like his father. The first thing he really could remember of him was the fact that this man spanks me. He hurts me. He got to the point where, you know, it drew blood on his bottom. And when you draw blood, that's considered child abuse. Even before that, it's considered child abuse. If you bruise, and he's so, he was so little. She says that I spanked him. Whoa. Whoa, you better ask her again who spanked him till his bottom bled. Have you beaten children? No, I do not beat children. You spanked them? I have, yes, I spank children. How I spank my children when they do wrong. 40 minute spankings? No. Repeated spankings? No, 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 no. Well, he spanked my daughter for between 30 and 40 minutes. Why didn't you stop him? I couldn't. There was a, a room full of 30 people. You step out of line, like I have done before, I swore at him. He grabbed one of these um, fellas there, which is three quarters, a bodybuilder, ripped a paling off a fence and just beat me around the yard with it. My daddy, you know what he used to do to me when I used to act up, when I had a bad report card? Can what? you imagine? We got our tails whomped. Maybe you did too. Did you whop tails here? Now, let me tell you something. Having my tail whomped, I told myself as a young man, when I grow up, I'm going to do it different, and I do it different. His final hold, religion. His version in word and music. These are the faces of the faithful those who entered the inferno. The followers of David Koresh, who are believed to have perished with him. We're all certain. <laughs> We're all certain for understanding. David Jones, third in charge of the compound, presumed dead. Steve Schneider, second in charge of the compound, his wife, Judy, and their baby, all presumed dead. Also presumed dead, Peter Gent, 
his twin sister, Nicole, and her baby by David Koresh. A tragedy that seems almost unimaginable to most of us, but a reality for Bruce and Lisa Gent of Melbourne, Australia. They lost their children and grandchildren to David Koresh, and they say it didn't have to happen. We've been trying for two and a half years to get the authorities to do something about this, and it's just hard to explain. It's we, we, the frustration of it all. We, we partly can condition to two and a half years of extreme frustration. In an exclusive documentary, Channel 9 of Australia closely followed the Gent grandparents in their frantic, pathetic 11th hour effort to rescue their children and grandchildren from the compound. I basically got hooked, I guess. Bruce and Lisa Gent got hooked on the teachings of David Koresh themselves when Koresh visited Australia in 1986. The young American who was visiting Australia in 1986. It was like turning on a radio that you couldn't turn off. He just kept on and on and on and on. He pushed the right buttons with each and every one of us. Each person has got their own button, their own Achilles heel. And he was able to, to, to turn that light on. Soon, the gents were living with the cult at a property in Palestine, Texas. Conditions were primitive. Home was an old converted bus or a tent. He basically influenced, influenced me to make the decision, well, I'll go because I wanted to do God's work for a change rather than, you know, do my own thing. There they discovered they'd made a terrible mistake. Koresh was having sex with their daughter, Nicole. Disillusioned, Bruce and Lisa returned to Australia in 1990, but their twins, Peter and Nicole, insisted on staying. Nicole said, as far as she was concerned, she now did not have any family anymore and no mother and father. Of course, by this stage, Nicole was pregnant to the man who said he was Christ. He selects whoever he wants to go to bed with, and I know that um, Nicole is quite a favourite of his, or was, and all the women compete to be the best, the best in bed. February 28th of this year, federal agents attacked the Branch Divinian compound in Waco. The gents, frightened for their kids, packed their bags and rushed back to the United States. They didn't yet know their son Peter had already died in the first shootout. We came to hopefully to hope on hope that maybe there's a chance of knowing something about the kids or... Might get to see the kids. Oh. Their first move was to contact the people who were negotiating for their children's lives, the FBI. At the present time, uh, you know, we have 16 people that have been released and uh, these uh, children are not among the ones that we have. Right. Is, is there... Can, can I... Look, I'm... I'm I don't know whether you've got any kids or... Yes, sir, I do. I have three. Well, we've just travelled from Australia. I understand. And we're to a stage where I don't know whether I've got two children or not, whether they've been killed or... Can you uh, enlighten me at all there? Yes, sir, we, we do have information from the children that we've already gotten out of the two elderly ladies that have been removed that there are casualties inside. Some people are dead. We do not know any names. What do you make? What do you do about it, honey? At that moment, their daughter Nicole was still alive. They hoped it would remain that way. The gents' 24-year-old daughter Nicole and two young grandchildren, among those presumed dead in the ashes of the compound. Their anguish is shared by other families trying to make sense of the powerful hold David Koresh had over their loved ones. His mind control was a potent blend of religious fervor, sex, and violence. There are other cults in the United States this tragedy upon tragedy may be a lesson in part for the future. Tonight we learned that one man who was asked by the government to make an assessment of David Koresh's mental status told the Justice Department that in his opinion David Koresh was not suicidal and there was no suicide pact by his followers. That man, Professor Murray Myron, believed that David Koresh wanted to go on preaching his view of the world, even wanted a book contract. Was that the reason the FBI did not consider suicide a real possibility? We'll ask the FBI director when we come back. As we continue our look at Waco,
past and future. We're joined in our Washington Bureau this evening by the director of the FBI, Judge Sessions. Judge Sessions, you looked at that first segment with us. Is there anything in your intelligence that helps you recognize that David Koresh? Well, the film was very interesting, particularly the segment uh, with Dr. Siemens talking about uh, the effect uh, of, the, uh, of the teachings on, on uh, Mr. Howell and Mr. Koresh. It, uh, I found it very interesting. Did you at the FBI ever consult anyone about uh, the Book of Revelations and the role it might play in Mr. Koresh's thinking? I did not personally, but yes, there was consultation with, uh, with scholars and with biblical people. And there was also, of course, a consultation with uh, psycholinguists and psychologists and behavioral scientists and psychiatrists and, of course, a great deal of, uh, of uh, reading of the letters and listening to the things that, uh, that Mr. Howell and Mr. Koresh had said. Having said all that, you're on record as having said, None of us expected them to commit suicide, and we didn't expect the fire. That is why correct. Did, why, why did you not expect it, given everything that's on the record? Uh, given everything that were, were base, pardon me, that were in the opinions, Peter, of the psychologists, of the lawyers who actually visited with him, of our conversations with him, his assurances himself, uh, dealing with the psychiatrists, uh, with the psycholinguists, the behavioral scientists, everybody believed that it would not be, that it, he was suicidal. Not everybody, because his lawyers have said as recently as this evening, a tough decision for the FBI, but the wrong decision. Decent men that made a mistake. Do you uh, want to take issue with that? Well, I think that's a matter of second guessing. Uh, when we were talking with them before, they were very clear. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Howell Koresh was very clear that he was, he was not intending to commit suicide. Quite the contrary. Uh, he was looking towards the future, and uh, he was very much interested in things in the future, and it, there was just no indication of it. Yet Koresh is also on the record as challenging you and the FBI on the ground that if you came for him or if you came after them, you would be devoured by fire. More than a year ago, the American Embassy in Australia warned you that the possibility of a mass suicide was there. Uh, Peter, I was not aware of what the embassy warned us a year ago. We came into the circumstance on the first day of March, 1993. Uh, on that uh, on that Sunday afternoon, uh, we were I volunteered that we would uh, help if they needed help, and they came back very quickly and did. And we sent our hostage rescue team out for the purpose of dealing with extracting those people from the compound. It was at that time we knew, of course, that there had been four uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms agents murdered, uh, shot in that uh, tremendous fuselage of uh, of uh, firepower and 15 or 16 officers wounded. Another tragedy without question, sir. You've referred, however, to all of the people who gave you advice. Yes. You try getting inside David Koresh's head. You're inside that compound, and the, and the Abrams tanks and the armored personnel carriers are moving up, and they're poking holes in your compound's walls. What do you think he would have thought? Well, I think, first of all, he would know what he had done. He would know that he was the murderer of those uh, of those agents who came to serve what society believes were lawful warrants, proper warrants, court-issued warrants, a warrant for his arrest. Uh, he would know that for 50 days uh, he had made multiple promises to us, which he had not kept. He had talked to us about coming out. He had promised he would come out. There had been people who came out. There were all sorts of things that he knew in his own mind about what he had done and what he had promised. He had even as late as the, the time dealing with, uh, with the Passover, uh, prom promised his lawyers and us that he would be out after Passover. So all these things, or if they were in his head at the time, he knew that he had not kept a single one of those promises. Uh, he knew that we were intensely interested in coming out, coming out safely, coming out with the lives of those children. We had dealt with him and negotiated with him for days trying to get all those children out. So he knew they weren't, and apparently, he knew what he was prepared to do because, in fact, in the end, it was those people who lit the fires with the fuel to, to, uh, to compound the, uh, uh, the event and the place exploded into fire and took the lives. Maybe it was the fire alone. Maybe it was some other source. We'll have to find that out later. Judge Sessions, I want to ask you some questions about the children and why you didn't wait longer, but I wonder if you'd just stay with us for a second. We learned something new today about David Koresh's state of mind when the siege began on February the 28th, to which Judge Sessions referred. 
A court affidavit was unsealed this evening, which included the federal authorities' explanation for the initial raid on the compound. On the morning of the raid, that's February 28th, Koresh was quoted as saying, he would never be taken alive. They got me once, he said, and they're never going to get me again. They are coming. The time has come. We asked ABC's James Walker to review the 51 days that followed. From the time the first shots were fired until 51 days later when the smoke finally cleared, there was one overriding question. Did the tactics used by federal law enforcement agencies contribute to the disaster or was David Koresh's self-proclaimed apocalypse inevitable? Today, ABC News learned that families of cult members from Australia hired private investigator Jeffrey Hosack who warned federal authorities in early 1992 that Koresh was dangerous and capable of leading his followers in mass suicide. In our opinion, from our analysis of this person, that uh, he was, uh, he appeared to be going down the track of A, uh, involving himself in a, in a Jonestown type of uh, mass suicide. The crisis began on February 28th. Officers from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, ATF, raided David Koresh's headquarters searching for illegal automatic weapons that had been stockpiled inside the Branch Davidian compound. I don't believe is that we were outmaneuvered or outplanned. The problem we had is that we were outgunned. Four ATF agents died in the assault. Sixteen were wounded. Other agents privately described the operation as badly flawed. Among the criticism, there was no element of surprise. Koresh had been tipped off. A helicopter carrying ATF agents came under fire over the compound before the assault began. There were no contingency plans, no emergency medical care, and requests by agents to carry more powerful weapons were turned down. Not only was the federal raid flawed, but some critics wonder if it was even necessary. Why didn't we just wait until Mr. Koresh went to see his dentist or to have his car repaired or anything else? Why engage in a confrontation? unless we must do so to protect human life. You had a building that had uh, 50 or more rooms in it, with uh, it known to have uh, at least 100 people, women and children, on the inside. That's a potential hostage situation before you go in. After the federal agents pulled back, the siege began. The FBI took over, brought in armored vehicles, and sealed off the compound. They were running over the bicycles. They were crushing the cars. They were. Uh, damaging the property is uh, as nice as I can put it. They're running over boats and pushing them out of the way and, and really uh, tearing up uh, a lot of their possessions. Uh, and, and he was angry about that. Negotiations with Koresh got underway. The goal is to resolve this situation ultimately in federal court with no further bloodshed. On March 18th, the FBI began increasing the pressure, blasting the compound with chants from Tibetan monks, the sound of a clock ticking and of a jet plane. It will give them many hours of wakefulness to ponder many things. But many critics considered the tactic yet another mistake. Richard Marsenko is the founder of the U.S. Navy's counter-terrorist unit, SEAL Team 6. It doesn't accomplish anything. It, it alienates them. They're, they're now a cornered rat. Uh, they've made their stand. They're going to be there. And, and these little... Games like this, if you don't take any action, just uh, make them feel that the, the, the world, everybody outside is against them. And, and, of course, he's there to preach to them, to say that this is the magic carpet ride and they're doing the right thing. I know of no theories of law enforcement that call for harassment of the bear in the cage, if you will, playing music in the middle of the night, uh, changing uh, the ground rules now and again, allowing attorneys in and not. Uh, I just, in my heart, and in my memory, see no rationale for that kind of thing. It seems to me that you're lucky enough indeed if you can get the issues on the table and negotiate those issues. But to complicate them by harassment and so on, I found questionable. Throughout the siege, there was always the concern that Koresh might lead his followers in mass suicide. We're very concerned as part of Koresh's grand scheme that he would like to see a large number of his people die which would be justification for his uh, pronouncements and be a fulfillment of the scriptures. Another major worry for law enforcement was the welfare of the 17 children under the age of 10 who remained inside the compound. Uh, he has surrounded himself with children 
Uh, he knows that we're not going to come up and start firing in the building because we don't want to jeopardize the lives of the children. But jeopardizing the lives of the children is exactly what happened on day 51. With negotiations apparently stalled, authorities decided to begin a 48-hour operation to slowly increase pressure on Koresh to surrender. ABC News has learned FBI officials did not believe Koresh would react by condemning himself and his followers to death by fire. Why use force, particularly potentially deadly force, crashing into the building, smashing in the roofs, dropping tear gas, and finally assaulting? Why use these things when they're is no indication of harm coming to human beings inside. David Koresh wasn't going to go anywhere. And absent again, uh, loss of life or threat of loss of life and so on, why would anyone think that you'd have to do these things? That they would have to... Harass, press forward, squeeze, to use your term, Mr. Walker. Introduce why squeeze him? Gas. Yes, why squeeze him? Absent the information that unless we do so, we're going to lose some people. Then I'm right back on the same page with what happened. But the authorities had waited 51 days. Well, wait 52, or 53, or 54. I have no problem with that, rather than seeing 80 people and, what, 17 children among them burned to death. And today, one of the few survivors of yesterday's disaster told reporters as he entered the jail in Waco that there was no mass suicide, that the fire began when the FBI started to assault the compound. So the operation in Texas that began with fatal miscalculations ultimately ended with even more disastrous consequences. Now, federal law enforcement is left with a litany of questions. How could so much go so wrong? Peter? Thank you, James Walker. I want to go directly back to Washington. The director of the FBI, Judge William Sessions, your response, sir. Uh, the question, Peter. The question was your response to the report you've just seen. Is it well, fair? I... Why not? What's the downside of doing nothing? I, th I think there are a number of things, Peter, that relate to what you've just seen. Uh, it is well known that the Bureau intended to be able to extract from the compound uh, those people safely, without harm to them. There were repeated discussions that took place over the 51-day period, constantly uh, replaying that theme that, in fact, these people should come out would be treated fairly, would be treated uh, according to the law, would be dealt with and not harmed. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Howell Koresh knew that. Uh, he knew that they would be dealt with that way, and early on, the, the, the second day of March, said, yes, indeed, he would come out. All we needed to do was allow him to play his 58-minute record, uh, and that was done. And, of course, he did not come out. My question at multiple to you, other sir, times when that happened, we were looking at being able to safely extract them. So my reaction to what I see is, it's easy to think back and say, well, they should have waited. We had waited 51 days. The negotiation had not been successful. The perimeter had been t gradually tightened and was gradually forcing him along that road to coming on out. Uh, there was no place else to go because we were already at the house. And the house was the last, that is the compound itself, the buildings were the last place where there was refuge. And to make it inhospitable for him, to make it difficult for him to remain there, was obviously what we intended to do. I, I agree, Judge Sessions, there's no sight like hindsight. But I ask you again, what's the downside of waiting except the cost to the federal government in dollars and cents? Well, first of all, there are several downsides. Uh, to be able to take and with a lawful warrant where a person had actually been involved in the murder of four officers. Now, the American public expect that law enforcement will deal with those people who have broken the law. So these people remained aloof from and unavailable to the law. Uh, the, the circumstance was, as has been made very clear, a deteriorating circumstance. Uh, there were 51 days of people being in that house that were dead. Uh, the the uh, conditions of, of hygiene and of... Uh, basic facilities were not there. There were 17 children in that facility. Uh, the practices that were referred to earlier in the films that you saw, people were continuing. Uh, the practices that have been uh, condoned in the past that were well known with Koresh. Uh, these things could not but get worse. Uh, it was a threat to the community. Uh, obviously he had a tremendous arsenal and tremendous firepower there. You saw the fireball go up. Uh, these things which lawlessness and which his comment, pardon me, his, 
his uh, acts had brought us to try to bring them out to be sure that they could be properly dealt with in accordance with the law. Forgive me, I want to interrupt you for a second and ask you a two-part question. First of all, c can you confirm for us this evening that you had electronically bugged the compound and so to some extent you knew, as we've been told by sources in the Justice Department, what was going on inside. And secondly... No, I would not discuss any techniques that we might have used, Peter, for, for gaining of intelligence. Okay. The second question is the abuse of children, which has been mentioned by you and by, by the Attorney General. Uh, David Koresh's lawyer said tonight he sees no evidence of that in the weekend. Give us a clue as to how abuse of children, particularly, had reached such a point that going in was preferable to having it continue. Well, I think what you have just said tonight, that there was an unsealed affidavit uh, that was uh, filed with the court papers. I have not seen that affidavit. Apparently, you have now seen it and know that it must detail those things which relate to the abuse of children. Uh, the film you have shown tonight relates to the continued abuse of children. Apparently, there were young girls in there who were mothers, uh, whose children were sired by Koresh himself. Uh, these kinds of things that happen that are not acceptable not lawful in our society, mm. were apparently part of his pattern. Uh, so these things were well known. And, uh, and uh, obviously, uh, it, it was a continuing pattern of use that was in the past and was presumed to continue. Is it fair to say, in a phrase, Judge Sessions, enough was enough? I think it's fair to say in a phrase that the time had come for him to submit himself for the law and for him to come out safely and soundly to surrender to law enforcement authorities uh, who could actually treat him according to the system of justice in this country. Yes, enough is enough. Thank you very much for joining us. Judge William Sessions, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, will be back in just a moment. Once again, from New York, Peter Jennings. We said at the beginning of the program that we were going to uh, try to understand cults a little better, and we're joined this evening by two people uh, who can give those of us in the country who know so little a better insight into what is going on. In Chicago, we're joined by Cynthia Kisser, who's the executive director of the Cult Awareness Network. And if I may be, uh, be permitted a small digression, if the director could change the key on which he is speaking to the rest of the country and not talk to me. Thank you very much. And from Reno, Nevada, Vicki Falabelle, who is a former member of the Branch Davidians. She was raised in the cult from the time she was eight. Her brother-in-law and his two sisters are believed to have perished. I'd like to go to Ms. Kisser first in Chicago, if I may. As I said, the executive director of the Cult Awareness Network, the largest cult watching organization in the country. Ms. Kisser, was this suicide or murder in Waco in your, from your point of view? This is not suicide because you did not have people actually understanding and making decisions about what was in their best interest. You had people who were under control. You had people, in a sense, who were ill, who had a mental illness, and who made decisions not fully thinking. Um, they basically have had their human rights violated, whether the public understands mm. that or not. Now, you study cults. Was this an ordinary cult? You know, I hate to say this, Peter, and this will probably shock a lot of people, but uh, I have a unique perspective on cults because m in my office, we sit every day, and in a slow month, and I mean a slow month, or slow week, I should say, we handle over 100 calls from people who have cult-related problems. This cult is not that different from a lot of cults that are out there. It just happened to have collided with law enforcement, and I think that's the real tragedy here. G give us, if you could, briefly a profile, a sort of a, a, emotional profile, of the people who would have been left in the compound with Koresh. The people who were left in were the tried and true. The people who were wavering had already been weeded out earlier on after the initial confrontation. These people had been so sequestered they had been so out of communication with the world. Their sleep had been controlled. Their diet had been controlled. Their personal relationships had controlled, been controlled to the point, and I want to stress this, to the point that anybody who had been in that environment, you or I, would have been putty in the hands of someone like Koresh. Might or should the FBI have ended this in any other way, in your view? Well, I think the concern here is that it isn't so much what the FBI did or did not do in this specific instance. There's a much bigger problem here, and that is that the general awareness, both from the top on down with this government and with the courts, in terms of what cults are, creates this situation over and over. 
Um, you yourself recall Jonestown in 78, now we're in 93 with Waco. There are over a dozen violent-related cult stories sprinkled in between that I'm sure you've covered. And there's just this pervasive lack of awareness and lack of education <coughs> that paralyzes everybody buddy, when these situations occur. Ms. Kisser, stay with us. Let me go to Vicki Falabelle, who's in Reno, Nevada. Ms. Falabelle, you joined this cult, or your parents joined this cult, when you were eight, am I correct? Yes. And am I correct in saying that you believe that your brother-in-law and his two sisters have perished? Yes. What's the lesson here for all of us? Think for yourself. Don't let someone else take over your mind. How hard was it to leave this cult? Very hard. Because? Because you're, you feel threatened that you won't be saved. Saved, meaning what? Well, they promise you heaven. And if you leave, the alternative is hell. So I thought I was going to hell when I left. Are you surprised by what happened in Waco? No. No. I knew they were going to die. What, what convinced you? David Koresh. He said that he was going to die. They were going to die for Christ. But you left. Why didn't others? Because they s believed. And I quit believing. There have been a lot of talk in the last couple of days from some of the families about family intervention or greater family intervention making a difference. You're shaking your head. Yeah, I, I, I tried. My parents are still in it. I, I never could convince them of anything. Your parents are still in the to. Branch Davidian, not in, not in the compound, right? Uh, my father was in the compound when it started and got out. At the time of the siege on the 28th? Yes. And so their commitment was so great, you as a member of the family were unable to reach them. That's right. They, they laughed at me when I tried to show them what was wrong. You can't, you can't convince them. They, they believe too strongly. They're brainwashed. Thank you very much, Vicki Falabelle, and in Chicago, Cynthia Kisser, the executive director of the Cult Awareness Network. When we come back, we'll go to Waco for a late report from our Bill Rediger. Mm -hmm. Finally, this evening, we return to Waco, where ABC's Bill Redeker is standing by. Bill, for much of the day, the FBI has been saying that it's been too hot and still too dangerous to go in and search the compound. What's the situation now? Peter, we've just learned from the Texas Rangers, who are in charge of the homicide investigation here, that that, condi that condition persists. In fact, they've only recovered one body to date, though they've seen the bodies of uh, children or victims in the uh, rubble that's about two miles behind me now. The reason is because there's still too much live ammunition. Only three officers have been to the area that's considered to be called Ground Zero. And in fact, what this all leads to is a longer investigation. We had earlier heard that it would probably take about two weeks for positive identification. Now they're saying it's going to take longer. Bill, you say they've cited the bodies of the children. Is there any indication of where in the compound they've cited them? Uh, not from the briefing that we just received from the Texas Ranger. Uh, the only thing that we know is that they can't get anywhere near the bodies because there's too much live ammunition. In fact, there were two large explosions this afternoon that we heard. The other thing that, uh, that, that struck us today in thinking about the environment at Waco is that there are a lot of people around, not a lot of people, but there's some people around uh, who were sympathetic to the Branch Davidians, and there are people who got out. Has there been a, is this the death of this cult in that neighborhood? I think the possibility for regeneration of this particular branch of the Branch Davidians is, is, is fairly substantial, mainly based on a couple of interviews that I conducted in the last day or two with those who got out on the 28th during the first confrontation with the ATF. They haven't lost the faith. They believe those who perished are in a better place, and their only regret is that they weren't part of it. I was struck tonight by Koresh's attorney who said uh, a wrong decision made by good men. He spoke admiringly of the, of the FBI particularly. Do you hear any second guessing down there at all? Oh, quite a bit of it, not only from uh, family members who, who lost people in the uh, conflagration here, uh, but also from people in town who thought 
They had been here for 51 days. They really hadn't uh, hadn't disturbed the community too much. And why not just let it continue? There, there's a lot of second guessing going on here. Okay, Bill Redeker, thanks very much in Waco, Texas. That wraps up our hour here on this decision to die, which the president said earlier today was very much David Koresh's. Uh, it has been the government line. There has been, among the second guessing, a suggestion by Branch Davidian members who got out that it was the government which actually started the fire by knocking over some kerosene lanterns with their heavy vehicles at the compound. Um, that's the kind of second guessing that will go on for a very long period of time. We'll be back in just a moment. Be like dead in? Well, that's not the lens crafter's way. Our 50% off frame sale means what it says. 50% off all lens crafter's frames. Don't miss lens crafter's. There's 50% off. <laughs> 3 a.m., Jimmy. Got something good waiting for you to home these days? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. 